Good evening and welcome back to The Path. It is Wednesday, March the 13th, and here we are again, ready to study the Word of God. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to have you with us today. This evening is a, a beautiful, it's been a beautiful day. We thank God for all of his blessings and just his goodness towards us. It's, he's so consistent. But welcome to the path. This is the discipleship program and Bible study program here at Set the Captives Free. This is session one and it's week number eight. And so we are in week number eight of session one for 2024. The path stands for pointing all towards heaven. And so it is the vehicle which we use to point people toward God, to encourage them to get closer to him, to get to know him. And it is our Bible study discipleship program. As we do each week, we start with 100 likes and 100 shares. Let's do that now. Take a few minutes. I'll pause so we can get going. You never know who you're going to end up inviting to Bible study and whose life will be blessed. We know the word of God is a blessing. And so when you share, it allows other people to find the classes and really get blessed. So thank you in advance for 100 likes and 100 shares. Let's take a moment to do that. hundred likes and 100 shares. I want to thank you in advance. And so let's move on. This 13 week course covering the New Testament book of Romans. That's what this is. And the book of Romans was written by the apostle Paul. This is one of the most profound and influential books in the New Testament of the Bible. This comprehensive study course is designed to provide a deep and thorough exploration of the theological, the historical, and the practical aspects of this significant biblical text. And so far, we've been doing all three of those. It's been very enlightening and very exciting. And by the end of this course, you and I will have a deeper understanding of the book of Romans in its historical and theological context and how its teachings continue to impact the Christian faith today and how we practice the Christian faith. Amen. So welcome back. This is week eight of a 13 week course on the book of Romans. Here you'll see that we covered chapter number one the very first night, we did an overview and an intro it's chapter number one. And then the second week, we did chapters two and three. Week number three, of course, we covered chapters three and four. I'm sorry, four and five, week number three, four and five. And then week number four, we covered chapter six and seven. And then from there, we begin covering individual chapters. Um, if you were to say so far what your favorite chapter is, what would it be? Go on and, and write the word, write the Romans and the number. Which chapter is your favorite so far? I can tell you, now I've read the whole book, but Romans chapter eight is my book. Oh my God, I love Romans chapter eight. But tell me what your favorite chapter is. Go on and put it in the chat. Ro write the word Romans and a number. 
What is your favorite? So we've covered everything on here. We've covered chapters one through 10. And tonight we're going to start in chapter number 11. All righty. All right. Get those chapters in the chat. I like the ring of that. Get the chapters in the chat. Tell us what's your favorite. And please only write one. <laughs> when we say favorite, we just mean one. But what is your favorite chapter so far? I mean, the whole book is amazing. But I'm, I know if you're like me, you have a chapter that's your favorite. So next week, of course, we'll look at chapter number 12. We'll overview that. And ver uh, then verse uh, chapter 13 and so forth until we complete this beautiful work, which has 16 chapters. Now, last week I did this and I also want to include them this week. I found a couple outlines uh, online that were really nice that I wanted you to have a chance to uh, add those to your records. I hope that you are downloading the PowerPoint from the class repository because it's a good way to build your Bible study notebook. I have had a notebook for years and still do. Um, in fact, I have several, but um, when you study, you want to retain what you're learning. And a great way to do that is to take notes and write little personal notes to yourself of things that you learn as you're studying, because those are the things that are going to come back to you. Amen. And uh, you're going to remember. So make sure you're writing this stuff down. So this outline I found particularly helpful. And then there was the other one, which we looked at last week, the cross, the ditch, the road, the plan, the world, the kingdom. Beautifully laid out. The road, uh, the cross, I'm sorry. At the bottom, the question that's answered is, what is the gospel of the Lord Jesus? The ditch why does man need God's provided righteousness? The road, how does God make sinful man righteous in Christ? The plan, how does God enable man to live righteous lives? The world, how has God made the proclamation of Christ's righteousness mandatory? And then the kingdom, how are God's people to live out of God's righteousness in this world. So I thought that was a beautifully organized, um, beautiful way rather to organize information. And I wanted you to have that as well. All righty. Well, let's get into tonight's lesson. And before we do, we always give you an opportunity to give. We uh, ask of you each week to give $10. You'd be surprised at how far, it only takes us $200 to feed a whole village on Sunday after church. And that's what our church does in Africa every Sunday. The kids from the village know that they're going to get a meal from the church up the street. And so that's just one of our outreaches. But whatever you give is tax deductible, and we appreciate it in advance. One more thing, if you're giving on Cash App, please put your first and last name so that we can uh, properly credit your giving record. Okay, so Father, I pray and thank you for the generosity of your people. God, I'm believing that everybody on here tonight will sow a seed of $10. It will go a long way and helping your, us do kingdom business. We thank you in advance and ask you to bless them to overflowing. Amen. So the theme of this beautiful work can be summed up in chapter number one, verses 16 through 17. The apostle Paul tells us, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. So these two verses really sum up the entire book. Now he, he does a very detailed job uh, explaining many things in this book. However, this is his aim. This is what he's talking about. The just shall live by faith. Now, when we look at an outline of the book, chapters one through four introduce the need for human rescue. The apostle meticulously set out to show that mankind was in need of salvation. And he did that very well. And then chapters five through eight focus on how Jesus forms a new covenant family. New, and, and you hear us say that in the communion script, the new covenant in my blood. Okay. And then chapters nine through 11, and we're on 11 today, describe how it describes how God will not give up on his covenant people. Even though the Jews rejected him, et cetera, he did not give up on them, nor will he. So that's chapters 9 through 11. Now chapters 12 through 16 we'll get into later. And that will discuss how love heals and unifies Jesus' family. Very powerful there. Somebody type, I'm part of Jesus's family. Yes, Lord. I am part of Jesus's family. And I thank God for that. I don't know about you. I thank God that I'm a part. Somebody else can type that. I thank God that I'm a part. So glad I wasn't left out. Hallelujah. All righty. So that's what we'll wrap up when we get to the end of this. Uh, this book has 16 chapters. And tonight we're in chapter number 11. Now here's some section highlights of this entire section. This section, let me go back a second. This section, chapters 9 to 11. Here's a summary of these three uh, chapters. Um, first of all, in the past, Israel has been selected. We learned that in chapter number nine. But in the present, Israel is being stubborn. Okay, they're not receiving Christ. They're not, uh, they're rejecting him. But then in the future, Israel will still be saved. Okay. Okay. So there are four questions that are addressed in chapter 11. If you want to write these down, these four questions will be answered in this chapter. Number one, have the Jews been rejected? We know that they rejected the Lord, but in, in this chapter, we'll figure out, have the Jews been rejected? Number two, can they be recovered? We know what, you know, what they've, done as far as Christ, but can they be recovered? Is it too late for them? And then have they been replaced? And finally, will they be restored? Will they be restored? So as we are going through chapter 11, you want to take a look at these questions and see what happens. All right, you're going to look for those answers. All right, let's move on. So here's some chapter notes. In Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul concludes his exploration of God's plan for his chosen people, Israel. So we'll see a shift from uh, chapter 11 to chapter 12 and it'll go in a different direction. But as for chapter 11, has God, uh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. 
The apostle concludes his exploration of God's plan for his chosen people, Israel. And it's true that as a nation, Israel has rejected faith in Christ, but somebody type, but a remnant of Israelites have believed in Jesus. So there's a remnant that are going to accept him, even though the majority have rejected him. Okay, and so he explains that God has not abandoned nor rejected Israel. God will keep his promises to his people. Somebody type, he has kept his promises to me. Lord have mercy. That is my testimony. He has kept his promises to me. And I, I know for many of you, that's true. He's kept his promises. Amen. We stood on his word and he's kept his promises. And what a good feeling it is to be able to trust in the Lord. Amen. Somebody type, I trust him. All right. So get your Bibles. Make sure you have your Bible and we're getting ready to go through chapter number 11 of the book of Romans. If you are here for the first time, could you type first time? We would love to acknowledge you. Some of you, this may be the first time you found our Bible study online and we would love to acknowledge you and make you feel very welcome. And then the rest of you, you know, I, I don't do this all the time, but um, in terms of attendance, it will be very helpful if you just type your name. If you're on here, just type your first and last name in the comments. Just your first and last name, would you? Thank you so much. That helps me take attendance. All righty. God has not totally rejected Israel. We're again in chapter number 11. And of course, we're going to start at verse number one. Isn't it comforting to know the Lord won't give up on you? It is for me, because some days you just don't have it all together, you know, and God is faithful enough to love you back to life. I just really love that about him and I appreciate it. Romans chapter 11. And this chapter is mainly, uh, predominantly about God's love for the Jewish people, how he feels about them in spite of the fact that they have not accepted his son. So verse number one, uh, the apostle Paul says, I say then, have God cast away his people? He's asking the question. Remember our four questions? God forbid. For I am, I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So the apostles acknowledging his lineage here, letting us know that he indeed himself is a Jew. Verse number two, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye, what ye not? What the scriptures say of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down, dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the uh, answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You see that in verse number four? So even though the, the, the majority of the Israel of Israelites have not accepted him, the Lord says, oh, I, pretty much in verse four, he's letting us know he has a remnant. There is a remnant, right? There is a remnant. And when you see there, uh, the the uh, word Isaiah is, is talking about the prophet Isaiah. 
Okay. Even so, we're looking at verse number five now. Even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Somebody type, thank God. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. But otherwise, is no work. You see that? So he's letting us know. Here's uh, the evidence supporting this. And this answers one of our questions. I believe, I believe it was the first one. God has not totally rejected Israel. The evidence supporting this is that there is a remnant. There is a remnant, amen? And it's according to grace, not according to works. You can't work this hard. You have to trust Christ. All right? So verse, um, where am I? Verse number five. Even so then at this present time, also there's a remnant, I've read that, according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. You see that in your Bible? And so this, we're down to verse number seven. Verses seven through 10 show that many have been hardened. In other words, their hearts are hard toward God and they don't believe him. They don't, they're not walking by faith, unfortunately. And not walking by faith. And we remember we looked at uh, in chapter 10 how they going about trying to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. I think for me, that's the saddest part that Jesus went through all that he went through to save us and some would still trust their own works to try and, and um, be the recompense for sin. I think it's just so sad. And that still exists in today's world. There are people who do not acknowledge God's plan of salvation, but they're trying to do it their own way. How many of you know people like that? Put a five in the chat. They say things like, oh, you know, I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. I don't do this and that and the other. And it's really sad. It's really sad. All right, so let's go on, um, look at verses, let's go look at verses seven, verses, start at verse seven. All right, what then Israel have not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And so this is a part of the hardening. And we know when um, the first time this is mentioned in scripture, the hardening of the heart was uh, with Pharaoh when he would not let the children of Israel go. The Bible said that his heart was hardened. So here we see that again that um, many have, have been hardened. Their hearts toward God have been hardened and they're not able to really believe like they should and trust God's grace, but their hearts toward him is hardened and they're doing things according to their own measures and their own devices. Verse number nine, and David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. 
Verse 10, let their eyes be darkened that they may see, I'm sorry, that they may not see and bow down their back all way. My God, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled at, that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. And so when we look at, we're on actually on the next, this next slide, we're looking at the hardening of Israel and the fallout from that. Believe it or not, there was some good in it because all things, all things work together for good. But unfortunately, um, you know, having a hard heart, it's not a good thing because when your heart is hard, you can't, you don't, you're not able to sense and understand the things that you need to, that are going to bless your life. All righty. So it starts at verse 11, talking about the Jewish stumbling and Gentile connection. The Jews, somebody typed the Jews stumbled, the Gentiles connected. Somebody typed the Jews stumbled, the Gentiles connected. And this is literally what happened. So let's start at verse number 11. I say then, how have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their full salvation, it through their full salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. And so do you see that there? Okay. And then verse uh, 12 says, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Where is, give me one second here. My papers are <laughs> kind of sliding around. All righty. So we're going down now to verse number 16. Now, if the fall, no, verse number 13, I'm sorry. For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. And so the apostle is saying here, um, I hope my, what he's pretty much saying is, I hope my kinsmen after the flesh are jealous of the fact that you guys have accepted Christ and in, by faith and have been justified. Because remember now in uh, chapter number number 10, that's what his heart was grieving. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That was really bothering him. And so we can see that in his writing, even over here in chapter number 11, that is a real thing for him. It's very frustrating. All right. So salvation to the Gentiles is an incentive for the Jews to repent. When the Jews look at how good God is being to those who've accepted Christ, it should make them turn, you know, really pay attention and turn around. That's what the apostle is saying. That by jealousy, if I can just provoke them to want to get right with God. I think they'll love it, right? Okay, and this is one reason why Paul magnified his ministry to the Gentiles. Paul, um, he, you know, Jesus came to his own and they received him not, but to as many as received him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. That's in John chapter one and um, chapter number one of, of the book of John, the gospel of John. And so here, the apostle Paul was sent to the Gentiles. He sent to minister to those who weren't even originally the ones that Christ came for. And then and with everything else, just such as life, then he has to warn them 
against getting arrogant because they start to get cocky about it. Like, hey, we're saved, this and that and the other. They get cocky. It says this. So the apostle begins to warn them, like, calm down. Don't get so excited. Verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. You see that? What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches are broken off, and thou being a, um, a wild olive tree, went gra wert grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the, but the root of choice. All righty. Is every, everyone clear? If you're clear, type clear. Verse number 19, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And we know that word graft means to insert. And so he's, he's letting the Gentiles know, listen, you have been grafted in, but don't get carried away. Don't, don't become obnoxious, right? To replace broken branches, true, but can just as easily be displaced and replaced. So he's letting them know, listen, we, you know, we inserted you, but don't get carried away. That's like people you meet, they get saved and all of a sudden they are instant, instantly uh, arrogant and think they know it all. And, and they don't. Amen. And so even after salvation, we have to stay humble, stay clear, do what God has called us to do. But don't get arrogant about your salvation because you didn't, you didn't, you didn't cause it. Amen. Christ took those lashes on his back for us. So look at this. In this chapter, he talks about the olive tree and he uses it as a comparison. There you see the nation of Israel. Um, and you see. Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. So on the other side, on the Gentile side, you see a wild olive, I can talk, a wild olive tree. Now, what does that mean? So you have your good olive tree and you have your wild olive tree. What does that mean, really? So the wild olive tree represents the Gentiles. Now, again, Gentiles are anyone who are not Jews. All over the globe, anyone that's not a Jew is considered a Gentile and who, who were not part of the covenant relationship with God as the Jews were. They were considered wild because they were outside the covenant community and were not cultivated by God in the same way as the Jews, right? So God loves us all, but the Jews were his people of covenant and who he came to first. And so everyone else comes behind that. Secondly, the apostle Paul explains that some branches of the olive tree which represents individual Jews were broken off due to unbelief while branches from the wild olive tree representing the Gentiles were grafted in, symbolizing their inclusion in God's plan and his, in his plan of salvation, excuse me, through faith in Christ.
All righty. The last one on here in terms of comparing the good olive tree to the wild one, the key difference between the good olive tree, Israel, and the wild olive tree, the Gentiles, really lies in their historical relationship with God and their standing in the covenant. Okay. The Jews had a special covenant relationship with God. And they were his chosen people. While the Gentiles were outside of this covenant, we weren't aware of it, we weren't included in it until we were included by faith in Christ. So I wanted you to see that comparison. Let me go back a second. I wanted you to see that comparison, the good olive tree versus the wild olive tree because there are references to it here in our text. Let me go back here. In fact, right there. There we go. All righty. The stolen chapter 11. And by the way, if you are here for the very first time, could you just type first time? We want to make sure we acknowledge you. And um, we are so thankful that you're hanging out with us tonight. We're here every Wednesday night and we absolutely love the word of God. It is literally changing our lives, just literally. Okay. And now we're talking about, again, the hardening of the, hardening of, uh, the heart and the blessing to Israel. We're in chapter 11. We're going to verses 25 to 32. And it reads, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the, of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, such as it is written, they shall come out of Zion, the deliverer. Wait a minute, my page. There shall come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's in verse number 26. Okay, you see this? And then verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So there you see, that was one of our key words in an earlier chapter, that word covenant keeps coming up because God has a covenant with, the, with Israel. He has a covenant with the Jews and we know that he is uh, not a covenant breaker, amen? God's, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, when God blesses you with something, he's not going to take it back. And he's not going to take it back because you don't act right or things don't go the way they should. God is a covenant keeping God. And so that's very comforting to me. Is that comforting to you that the Lord will not change his mind? Somebody type, he has not changed his mind about me. Thank you, Jesus. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, and then um, verse 26 goes on to reassure us. It says, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. But this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Okay, you see that? And so it goes on to let us know that, yeah, they're going to obtain mercy just like the Gentiles did. God's not going to leave them out, right? Because we already know, according to 2 Peter, that God is not willing that any should perish. Somebody type not willing. 
He's just not willing. God's will, his perfect will and his desire toward mankind is that none of us should perish. That's his desire. However, we know that some people through their actions and choices, uh, unfortunately, they reject him. And, and God will never force himself on anybody. It's not going to happen. Amen. But his desire is that all should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so uh, in verses 29 to 32, it makes it clear Um for the gifts and calling, I've read that, verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. For God have concluded that all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So down to verse 32 is all about God's love for his covenant people, which are the Jews. And then when we get to verse number 33, it shifts and God's judgments uh, are uh, there is the focus of these final verses. It says, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Just amazing. For who, verse 34, for who have known the mind of the Lord or who have been his counselor or who have, or who have first given to him and it shall be compensated fresh unto him again, shall be compensated, I'm sorry, unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so make no doubt about it. The apostle wants to, to set forth in uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11, that God still loves Israel. He, he's making that very clear. All righty. So chapter 11, that's it. It's a little shorter than some of the other chapters. And as we get closer to the end, the chapters are getting shorter, but nonetheless, more uh, they're no less important than anything we've read earlier. All righty. So stay with me a minute. Bible study is not over. Now here are the five witnesses of Romans chapter 11. Number one, proving the future redemption of Israel. Uh, the witness of Paul can be found in chapter 11, verse one. Okay. And when we say the witness of Paul, remember, he introduced himself and shared his lineage. That he was an authentic Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. Now, the witness of Elijah. That's in, in uh, we just read Romans chapter 11, verses 2 down through 10. You have the witness of Elijah. And then verses 11 through 15, the witness of the Gentiles. You see, they're the witness of the Gentiles. You have five different people, five different uh, groups here attesting to the future redemption of Israel. Then you have the patriarchs. Chapter six, uh, 11, verses 16 through 24. And then you have the witness of God. Last but certainly not least. Okay. So there's a lot going on. It's so awesome when you um, take time to study and you really break down this stuff. You see that there's, there's a lot written here. And uh, this whole book, as we said, is a significant text. 
But uh, you can look at uh, chapter 11 and just see the comfort that's provided to Messianic Jews uh, when they when they read this, because uh, there are Jews that do believe in Jesus. And and just like the Apostle Paul, can you imagine the burden they have on their heart for their people? to really come to know Christ, to be set free, to be healed, to be delivered. Oh my God, it's just, uh, just, it would burn my heart. And so I'm sure it burned his. So there are the five witnesses in this, but just in this chapter. All righty. So we're done. We got to finish a little early tonight because that, that was all there was to that particular chapter. But now remember, you can go before you go, hold on. You can go to our website and make sure if you missed any classes that you go on the website, our church website, look under Bible study and you can find any of the old classes there. They are also listed on our Facebook page. So you can go back any lesson that you've missed it's important that you get it. You want to make sure you got every, got them all in. Amen. And they'll be there even after we're done. And you may have uh, have your notes and you finish, but you can always go back and refresh what it is that you learned prior. Um, Saturday is our Builders Women's Prayer back Breakfast, excuse me, in honor of Women's History Month. Our very own Pastor Tawana will be preaching. And I hope you have your tickets because it's now sold out. Don't forget. Now, the link just went up this week for the Good Friday uh, fish dinner. And so make sure, let me say it, make sure you get your tickets early. Make sure you... You know, make sure you get them before they sell out. It's going to be a powerful time. This will be the very first time the Alliance Pastors and I got together to provide such a service, and it will be absolutely wonderful. So you want to go in and get those. And then Old Fest is coming. Can you all believe how quick a year is going? It just seems like we just had Old Fest. My God. And so that committee's forming now. You're a person that has an interest. Make sure you sign up. We're going to need a lot of hands on deck that day. And so we want to give you an opportunity to be a part. Well, it's time to close out in prayer. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. As always, uh, I enjoy you guys every week. Uh, I'm not sure when we'll start in-person Bible study again yet, but I absolutely enjoy you, even if it's on here. It is such a blessing. For how many of you, it, is it a blessing to study the word of God? Yeah. Put it in the chat. Amen. It's a blessing. It really is. And to do it together with other people is the key. Because if you do it alone at home, you may finish it or you may not. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this time together tonight. Thank you for your word. It continues to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you for the historical context. Thank you for the theoretical context. Thank you for our opening the eyes of our understanding so that we can observe beautiful things out of your word. Give us understanding and we will keep your law. Amen. And Father, a bless, bless, bless each family represented on this uh, study and their close family members. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody together said, amen. <laughs>